Good evening, everyone, and um, a very warm welcome to the first seminar for the Centre for English Legal History, Michaelmas 2023. A couple of brief announcements. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to remind everyone that the seminar is being recorded and will be uploaded to the Centre's YouTube channel. Secondly, as usual, we'll head to the Grant to Pub for drinks and or dinner. Professor Gierty has very kindly in, um, agreed to join us, and you're all very welcome to come along. So this evening, we're delighted to have Professor Gierty presenting to us. Professor Connor Gierty is currently Professor of Human Rights Law at LSE Law School. He's also a practicing barrister and an honorary King's Council, a member of the Royal British Academy, a fellow of the Royal British Academy, and a member of the Royal Irish Academy. He obtained his undergraduate degree in law at University College Dublin, his master's and PhD here at Cambridge, and has held teaching and research positions at Cambridge and King's College London. Professor Gierty has published widely on terrorism, civil liberties, and human rights. He's the author of works including On Fantasy Ireland, Britain, Europe, and Human Rights, which is on the European Convention on Human Rights in UK Law, and Homeland Insecurity, The Rise and Rise of Global Anti-Terrorism Law, which will be published next year. Today, he will be presenting on the suffragettes and civil liberties. Please join me in welcoming Professor Gierty. Very much, wasn't it? Is this quite easy to work? It looks easy to master. Yeah, I might actually manage that. Uh, and there's some people online I'm now looking at, so welcome. Welcome to you all. Nice to see you. Unbelievably, I taught Neil. You reminded me of that rather cruelly. <laughs> rather cruelly. Uh, so you know you're getting old not just Neil, but when you've taught the Chief Justice. So some of you may know the new Chief Justice was a student at Trinity College, Cambridge, and I taught her first year criminal law, and she's boasted she got the best first that year, which befits a future Chief Justice. So I essentially take the credit for the success of her career, and I'm really in the shadows, the Chief Justice of England and Wales. So it's lovely to be back. I spent seven very happy years as a fellow of Emmanuel College, before which I did my PhD, uh, and during which I did my PhD, and uh, I did an awful lot of my formative thinking here. So I'm delighted to be back. I'm more or less invited myself, I'm afraid, uh, because I want some advice at the end on what to do with this. So you guys will know where to put stuff and how best to present it. I'm at a bit of a loss. I've been thinking about this subject for a very long time. It's been on hold uh, recently, and I'm coming back to it. And it fits within my current primary interest. It certainly wasn't called terrorism, the suffragette movement, in the first decade and a half, 1904 to 1914, of the 20th century. But Going into the record and looking at the treatment of it in courts and newspapers, it, it felt turbulent at a turbulent time. Uh, I first began thinking about this paper as a possible part of a book which appears, The Struggle for Civil Liberties, which I wrote with my colleague whom I met here at, at Cambridge, Keith Ewing, and we followed up Freedom Under Thatcher with Struggle. And I had thought that the suffragettes would be a part of it, but we decided to concentrate on the period 1914 to 1945. So they made it, as it were, into the introduction. What I am uh, very interested in, I notice coming back time and time again to it, is, is where law fits in, in the broader political context of the day. So I'm quite history oriented, con fairly contemporary history, 19th century to up to a point. I haven't written much on it, but the 20th century, a lot, actually. Uh, and, and, and the new book, which has received a rather catastrophic reminder of its topicality at the weekend with the horrific events in Israel and Gaza, tracks the rise of anti-terrorism law, which is interesting. Nobody's done it. There's an awful lot of books about the history of terrorism. I've written one myself, but there's none on, on, on the anti-terrorism law, so I'm, I'm excited about that. And I think that the suffragettes, interestingly, <clears throat> I never came across them. In, in, in my work tracing the origins of the language of terrorism. It, it wasn't used. It, it was used as a description of violence in India in the 1920s, 
it certainly was a description used in the parliamentary debates to justify anti-IRA coercive laws at the end of the 1930s. And it was used, among other labels, in the 1940s and the 1950s, Malaya, Kenya, Cyprus, and so on. But it, it interestingly wasn't a, a word that I found, I came across independently to describe the activities of the suffragettes. Though, as we'll see, uh, towards the end, the suffragettes was a term coined by the male, but it took off, as it were. Uh, as we'll see, they, they engaged in pretty random kinds of violence towards the end, uh, uh, which, which I may get to. Uh, I, in my very first book on terrorism, way back in 1990, I had a chapter called The Spiral of Brutality. And I am convinced that there is a momentum towards greater and greater violence in the part of subversive groups that engage in violence, away from legitimate targets and towards increasingly, in inverted commas, morally questionable targets. And I think it played out with the suffragettes, just as we see it playing out all around the world. It's rather sad prequel. Uh, the way I've organized this is to talk about the suffragettes, to tell you a little, I'm going to speak for about 40 minutes or so, and you keep an eye on the time, somebody, because I'm a bit vague on time, and I'm aware we're still on PowerPoint one, so <laughs> there are risks <laughs> in extemporization. I do have a paper. I'm going to I'm going to try and read from it now and again. So it's a different kind of talk than my usual sort of noisy talk. Uh, but I'll finish in about 40 minutes. And the organisation of it is to talk a little bit about the the, the initial role of politics, uh, and and then the role of law uh, and the role of political violence, and a little bit in contemporary. I'd be interested in drawing out contemporary. I'm not sure how much I'm going to say about it here. What do we learn? What do we learn? Uh, and they got going. Uh, I think it's the first great civil liberties I'm reading now, as I will now and again from the paper, the first great civil liberties campaign of the 20th century. Uh, as we shall see, uh, it was grounded in a strong claim. This is quite interesting, constitutional entitlement. It, it was a curious radicalism that grew from an attempt to accept and extend the status quo, not a rejection of the status quo. What comes through is quite a naive, we might say cynically, belief in the British constitutional order and the desire to have it fairly applied to those who sought the vote for women and to deliver the vote for women. Uh, I see the right to liberty. I started a book on civil liberties in 2007 with the right to vote. I see it as perhaps unusually, the, an essential civil liberty. Uh, and nowadays we might call it a human right. But interestingly, uh, and I went through all the literature and I won't go through it now, but there's very little on the suffragettes in the standard legal textbooks. Every now and again, cases get in as a kind of footnote, binding orders, see Lansbury and Riley, the defense of necessity in criminal law, see, uh, see the, the, the force feeding case from 1900 and Nine, Lee versus Gladstone. Uh, so it's, it's here and there, but the Public Meeting Act, hardly ever mentioned, and if mentioned out of context, why did it happen? Uh, and also the various binding over orders, uh, never mentioned. And I, I say all that, actually, some of us here may remember uh, David Williams. This work is very much in the spirit of David Williams. David Williams, after whom this building is called, was my research supervisor. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a couple of books in the 1960s, which uh, went into the record in fresh ways and found in newspapers accounts of cases that had not been noticed by the more conventional text. So it's, it's, in, it's in celebration of the kind of work he did uh, that I, I offer these two remarks as well. If I'm going to make a contemporary point, uh, I'll make three, three just to plant them there. And I, won't, I don't think I'll come back to them, though the slides might guide me to them. What's interesting as a big point is not as much has changed as people think. Uh, and I think I'm, I'm going to hold to that as a general proposition. I made a mistake once in 1986. I was still here in Cambridge. I was a teacher in Emmanuel College. I wrote an article in the New Statesman, Is Britain Becoming a Police State? And I'm now embarrassed by it, to be honest with you. Uh, and I ask myself, how come Britain is always becoming a police state but never becomes one? How come? <laughs> And it was about the Public Order Act 1986, and before that, the Police and Criminal Evidence Act 1984. And what we thought was evidence of a police state is now regarded as evidence of decency and good conduct, in particular the Police and Criminal Evidence Act. It's hard now to believe that we thought holding somebody for, what was it, Neil, about 48 hours was a monstrous invasion of civil liberties. And so 
it, it's, it's amazing how our perception of things changes. And this is a tiny contribution to remind us that the, that the system of managing dissent has always been pretty tough and has always been greeted as very tough by those who are victims of it. I am not running down recent changes. I am not suggesting we take them with a pinch of salt, but it's in a long tradition that they fall, less fresh maybe than we might think. Uh, and secondly, uh, what's interesting is how dependent, I've said this before, I think just now, I won't linger on it, how dependent on constitutional ideas the suffragette protesters were more so than today, I think. And third, to keep an eye for is executive interference in sentencing, which is very interesting and happened a lot. Uh, and so there's really interesting, the paper has lots of details, longer paper, or examples of the executive leaning on the judiciary and the senior judiciary leaning on junior to undo sentences. But in particular, the way in which sentences were served, that was the thing. There were various divisions. There was a sort of idea about a political prisoner, which had grown in the late 1890s. And the question was whether they were political prisoners. So there were a number of points to look out for. Uh, I'm moving on to the substance. And I'm, I've, I've said to you, I'm, I'm presenting it as three things, faith in politics, uh, faith in the law, and faith in themselves, what I call them in the paper. Uh, and and look, look at the politics, first of all. There's a little tiny bit of background. Uh, 10th of October, 1903, I think. I'm sure I, I took it right. Yeah, 1903, that's when they started. And the day were the World uh, the Women's Social and Political Union, WSPU. What had been going on? Quite a lot had been going on. Uh, there had been a famous uh, book, uh, which had been celebration of the right of women to engage in politics as early William Thompson, but Anna Wheeler, people now think, was the driver of it in 1825. There had been the first, well, not the first, I wouldn't risk that, but a strong petition in 1832, obviously energized by the great Reform Act of that year. Uh, there were petitions to Parliament in 1866. Uh, we know about the Reform Act 1867. And there were advances. The municipal vote was achieved in 1869 for women. And we had the path breaking. One of the, your co-ordinators doing a history of property law. So you, you, I will challenge you, what year was the Married Women's Property, whatever it is, Act? And you have to say immediately 1882, or you'd be very embarrassed. So, so, so there was quite a lot going on. And these cases, the first ones I put on the board, I call this fate in politics. It was an early stab at, at, at law. Uh, and they're fascinating. And, and they're not the only ones. And essentially, uh, the other ones include a lot of women who wanted to avail of this argument, which I think when it first came up, they must have thought was knockout, which is the Brougham Act, if I'm pronouncing them right, 1840, man shall include woman, him shall include her. You'll all know that principle of statutory interpretation. So in these cases, the details of which are in the paper and into which I will not now go, these uh, 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 people were challenging their inability to vote on the basis that the recent reforms, look at the date, setting 68, uh, which had limited uh, exercise of the franchise by men, should apply uh, to people in analogous positions who are women, because the him carries the her. And uh, neat, exciting, and failed. So they had an early effort to transform by law uh, the position. It failed. Uh, the details of why it failed are in the paper, but it's clear that it failed. It would have been quite a big ask for a bench at any point to introduce uh, uh, such a radical change to the electoral role by dint of a 38-year-old piece of legislation, 28-year-old piece of legislation, not specifically designed for that. But there you are. There you are. It, that then uh, pushed them back uh, to petitioning Parliament. Uh, this became a kind of annual event in the 1890s, in particular into the early 1900s. And as many as a quarter of a million people signed a petition in 1894. There's been a new book on petitioning parliament by one of, uh, one of, the, legal, uh, one of the historians. Who's, it's terrific on this. Uh, and it's fascinating how this was a little bit sort of kind of 
early 17th century-ish, you know, if we get to the king, it'll be all right, you know. If we get to parliament, it'll be all right. So there was already, in that period, there was a kind of sense of confidence in the men who ran the place. And I have a cutting remark, at least I believe to be cutting, that, that the more ineffective they were, the more uh, warmly they were received. So it became one of those traditions in the British Constitution. You know, somebody would show up with the petition and the politicians of the day, I presume Salisbury, wherever it was, Balfour would receive it. Uh, and they'd say, what a tremendous thing, the women have come here. And then tea would be made, presumably, by all. And there's a very good uh, critical analysis by Emmeline Pankhurst about these events, quite funny. I've read, not in the original, but in the secondary literature, where she describes one of these occasions uh, where there's a genteel rejection of everything they stand for, masked by an intense civility. Uh, and the, the WSPU, remember, that's where they kicked off as the, uh, in 1903, they were a reaction to this, uh, to the politeness. And they, from early on, were altogether more disruptive, altogether more disruptive. Uh, a suffrage measure was talked out on the floor of the House of Commons in 1904, as early as that. And uh, Mrs. Pankhurst organized an impromptu protest meeting outside Parliament. Uh, and I say in my paper, which in an early lesson about the reality behind the Constitution of Facade, rather strongly put, was speedily broken up by the police. And then they reconvened at the gates of Westminster Abbey, where uh, the cure of his day, and not today's cure, the cure of his day, Keir Hardy, came out and offered them a kind of protection. So, so there was a very early negative interaction with the police. And then on uh, 13th of October, 1905, uh, Christabel Pankhurst uh, with Anne Kenny, two big players in the world of suffrage, uh, they attended a meeting at the Free Trade Hall, Manchester, and uh, Sir Edward Grey uh, was speaking, and it was organized in support of the Liberal candidates for Parliament in the district, who is Mr. Winston Churchill. And, and as you may know or would guess, women weren't allowed question. They, they could be there. And Kenny asked a question, uh, but it was, it was ignored. Uh, she wrote it down and passed it on to the chair. It was still ignored. And uh, the two women then unfurled uh, uh, what is described in one of the books as a slightly tawdry banner on which was inscribed votes for women. And a disturbance followed as the women persisted. Uh, so, so they weren't polite. So they weren't polite. They were unceremoniously ejected from the hall. Uh, and they were shouting the question, the question, answer the question. Christabel then organized a meeting directly outside the hall. And uh, she and Anne Kenny were arrested and, uh, for obstruction. And, and then Christabel, who was a law student, by the way, she spat at the police officer. So it was uh, in order to increase the charge, which successfully happened to assault, and, and she was, and, and they were jailed. Christabel for seven days and Annie for three. Uh, it worked, it worked. Votes for Women was in the news. It had been, you know, it's, it's a very modest deployment of political violence to communicate which is wearing my other terrorism law hat. That is the essence of what terrorism is. But the language wasn't used. And the spit was pretty mild. Uh, interestingly, Churchill uh, was alive to the implications of the protest. He copped on very quick. He went to St. James's jail and he tried, he tried to pay the fines. You see, they refused to pay the fines uh, because they were heroic martyrs for the cause. And uh, the legalistic governor, his grace said, no, you can't, you can't. So Mr. Churchill, uh, the future savior of the country, et cetera, et cetera, had to leave the prison and they were able to be unsaved by him. So, so that was uh, beginning to be par for the course. Uh, 
uh, there was a tremendous, it's very well known, tremendous amount of heckling during the election campaign that saw a final change out of the Conservatives into the Liberals. Initially, Henry Campbell Bannerman, if he was Henry, I think he was, he's got a relation who's a UKIP guy, now Tory, I think, so I mix them up. But he, David, he's not David, he's Henry Campbell Bannerman. And uh, they, they got the idea uh, in 1907, eight after the election, uh, they got the idea of having a women's parliament. So this became a regular thing. They convened close to parliament and marched on parliament at the same time as the king's speech. A woman's parliament was established in 1907 at uh, Caxton Hall, and then a procession emerged and a large deputation uh, was repelled by the police. Their complaint was that the king's speech, as it then was, the king's speech had contained no reference to women's suffrage. And uh, the police used both foot and mounted officers. There were many arrests and there were imprisonments of 54 suffragettes for two weeks. So Holloway is full up, that's the prison, the Daily Mail reported. Uh, there were quite a lot of disruptions of this sort. The police and the charging authorities resorted to quite a lot of minor charges that wouldn't have jury trial and a very great deal of binding over orders. And of course, these can only be found uh, by, by, by the newspaper reports. It's, they're, not, they're not really evident in the, in, the, in the formal court records that we come across as academics or I come across looking at the law reports. Uh, in early 1908, a number of women managed actually to chain themselves to Downing Street, and one leading suffragette, Mrs. Drummond, actually managed to burst into number 10. You know, it, those were the days, weren't they? So, so there was quite a lot of that about, and, and the authorities cracked down. There were a lot of arrests, as I've said, prosecutions, uh, and after particularly egregious pandemonium, the Public Meetings Act was passed in 1908. It was specifically as a reaction to the disruption of meetings by the suffragettes. It was introduced by, uh, it passed the House of Commons, both houses in record time. Uh, the, 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 the Lord Pioneer pushing it through in the Lords said, quote, uh, from the debates, no bill has ever passed through the other house with greater rapidity than this one except a bill dealing with dynamitards, which about 20 years ago was passed through all its stages in less than an hour. That's a reference, of course, to what were then called the Fenians or the IRB. And the combination of the Public Meetings Act and the earlier reference to the controls on dynamiters are a reminder that panic legislation to resist so-called kind of nowadays terrorism threats are pretty well established in the genre. It's not a new thing. Uh, uh, it's the emergency that demands the measure is fast nowadays, but it's not less than an hour, not less than an hour, which it was with the, the Fenians, and certainly was also very fast with the Public Meetings Act. The Public Meetings Act uh, had very little impact. There was a report on it in the 1920s. It became, interestingly, really important in the 1930s with the fascists because there was a similar sort of thing. Uh, people were disrupting fascist meetings and the names and addresses of those disrupting were passed to the chair. So whereas in the relatively innocuous world of the suffragettes, that wasn't spooky. If you are disrupting a, a, a meeting of Mosleyites and the chair is the chief Mosleyite and uh, the stewards are legally entitled to secure your name and address, and to pass it to the chair, that is an unattractive possibility. Uh, and so it was interesting how the Public Meetings Act came back in as an indirect inhibition to protest very much later on. Uh, they gave up on politics uh, in this slightly fake distinction in order to make the talk understandable. They gave up on politics and they switched to what I call, for the sake of argument, faith in the law. And this is where their belief in the integrity of the system shows through. They weren't revolutionaries. They were constitutionalists. 
uh, you might say they're a bit like uh, climate protesters from affluent backgrounds. Today, I, I had a drink with one in a pub and tried to explain to her that the legal system was fairly brutal to protesters uh, when she expresses amazement that she's arrested and charged with serious criminal offences for having protested out, outside a courtroom. So there is a sort of similar sort of sense of a belief on the part of these uh, protesters that they can rely on the Constitution to defend them. They had a tremendous win uh, early on where they were engaged in a, a disruption. Uh, let me get it up here. Uh, they were engaged in a disruption at a meeting which was being held at which were speaking the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Lord George, and the Home Secretary, Herbert Gladstone. And the charges of unlawful assembly were not brought. Uh, they want to make sure there was no jury. So they charged them uh, with something much more minor. I think it might even have been some kind of breach of the peace, or it was a summons, maybe it was a binding over. But <laughs> the, the defendants managed to get the magistrate, if it was a magistrate, I think it was, to summon the Chancellor of the Exchequer and the Home Secretary as witnesses uh, for the defence. It's rather clever of them. Uh, they'd been there, they said nothing happened, and before, before actually we can, we, can, we can prove nothing happened because we have here the Chancellor of the Exchequer and we have the Home Secretary. And of course, as witnesses for the defence, uh, the, the, the defence then laid on what Emmeline, Panker, Pet, uh, Emmeline Pethick Lawrence called a suffrage meeting attended by millions. It was rather clever of her. So they, they reversed the short trial, is what I mean. So they, they turned the, the trial into a trial of the political leaders that had, as it were, in their view, kind of orchestrated the, the clampdown and had continued to reject, uh, reject women's suffrage. The right to petition parliament then became increasingly important. They had, as you remember, I was saying, they had this idea of old, of, of having the women's parliament and a march on parliament, and they really believed they had a right to petition parliament. And they went back to uh, the Bill of Rights, which they actually had inscribed on one of the organizations called the WFL, and they had it inscribed on their caps, the guarantee the right of British subjects to petition the monarch. And by extension, the petitioners argued ministers. So it's petition the monarch, the old idea, and now it extends to ministers. They acknowledged that the tumultuous petitioning act of 16. 61 uh, had stated that petitions had to be signed by 20 or fewer individuals, only 10 of whom could present their petition. But, but they said, that's fine, we're well within the law, we're presenting a petition in a group of 10 supported by, they hope, 10,000. So it's, it's the old distinction between a protest and a demonstration or whatever, you know, there's, there's the notional six and then there's the 100 outside. Uh, and they were very proud of this and very sure that they would do very well. And they got their chance in a case where they were able to litigate to the appeal level uh, in a case, uh, one of a number, but I've chosen it here in the limited time I have, which is uh, on the, is it on the slide now? Pankhurst and Jarvis. And the request to disperse had been said the magistrate correctly made. And the reason it had been made was it had been made under the sessional order. Now, some of you may not be aware of this, but Parliament issues an annual sessional order, which allows the police to control the vicinity of Parliament. And uh, the conviction, which was uh, against the Honourable Evelina Haverfield, uh, before a High Court bench made up of Lord Alverston CJ and Channel and Coleridge JJ, uh, they argued that the ladies had not created an obstruction, so there was no offence in that regard, and that their right to petition a member of parliament involved a duty on the part of such members to receive such positions. This was a reasonable exercise of the right, they said, directed against the prime minister because he, quote, more than anyone else in the country, was a repository of political power. And they backed it up with the legislation and there weren't more than 10 of them and so on. And they lost. Lord Alverston, giving the judgment of the court, the Lord Chief Justice, agreed there was a right to present a petition, 
but not that there was a right to present it by means of a deputation. I'll allow that distinction to linger. Uh, Mr. Rathquist's refusal to receive the deputation was quite legitimate, though entirely different from any, any refusal to receive the petition. So it was, all he'd done is refuse to receive the deputation, which is entirely different from refusing to accept the petition. And in fact, going further, he had not refused the petition, he had refused the deputation. Uh, so the Lord Chief Justice was able to say, without throwing the slightest doubt on the right to petition, these ladies were breaking the law. Uh, you know, I mean, I think, to be honest with you, I think they were being extremely optimistic. I mean, is it the job of the Prime Minister to hang around central lobby for scores of people, queues of people of 10 or more, to line up behind various other causes to insist that he receive a petition? But they really thought they'd win. And they were really let down by the law. And it was a kind of memory of cases they'd forgotten of the Charlton cases from the 1860s. And it came around the time of Nairn, which is a very well-known case, which is the one that rules out the right of women to vote as part of the university uh, electorate in Scotland, some very powerful dicta there against the possibility. And of course, then alluded to a couple of times, the case of Lee versus Gladstone. You remember a bit like the IRA and the Beto Meinhof Red Army faction, uh, hunger strikes have become a, a tool and it was a tool deployed in prison and it gripped the headlines in the way that the slow malingering deaths of the IRA prisoners in early 1981 gripped the headlines here. Uh, and uh, the solution was uh, in firstly Lee versus Gladstone, I get onto the statutory intervention in a minute, was uh, to say there is a criminal defense of necessity. And I've gone into, LSE has this remarkable women's library with amazing suffrage material. Uh, too much if you, if you want to research, that's the trouble. But the newspapers of the time, the suffrage newspapers were full of the recounting of the horrors of forcible feeding, of the absolute horrors of forcible feeding. And the Gladstone there was, of course, William Gladstone's son, Herbert Gladstone, the Home Secretary, who was the defendant in the case as the relevant authorizing minister, I suppose through the governors for this activity. So the law let them down. Their belief in petitions and so on did not deliver. Their belief in constitutionally legitimate protest did not deliver. And the courts repeating the 1860s did not deliver on a right to vote. And so we enter the, the third phase. I think it, it sort of works, actually, to be honest with you, because there's a definite change in tenor in the period leading up to the First World War. Uh, they, they give up for a bit, a truce it's rather grandly called, but they give up for a bit. Uh, and then there's the possibility of a conciliation bill, which means some kind of compromise. It never happens. And, and then Asquith, who was now <coughs> the prime minister and was prime minister for a lot of this period, and who found the suffragettes as a tremendous reference in his diaries to uh, Ven Venetia Stanley, to the tiresome suffragettes. Uh, and he really didn't like them. And they did chase after him a lot. It was very irritating and make tremendous amounts of noise wherever he went and so on. Uh, and try and get into his house the whole time and so on. So I can understand they were intensely irritating. But then he announced universal male suffrage. And, and this might be regarded, to put it extremely mildly, as modestly inflammatory. So, so the, the, uh, the suffragette movement re-energized, but, and here's a, 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 actually, a, from my experience of working in the field of political violence, absolutely typical. They have nowhere else to go. It's, it's a bit like that horrific thing that happened at the weekend. So they go to violence. It's, it's, it's beginning to lose its strategic value, if it had any. It's beginning to lose its power as a mode of communication. And as so often happens, uh, the spiral of brutality are referred to. It becomes a thing in itself. And this is, I think, uh, why I'm, I'm, I'm really against subversive violence in democratic cultures, actually, because the noisy violent ones always win the internal argument to go a bit further, to go a bit further. It's very difficult if you've committed 
to violence, in, to be able to rein it in. I mean, one of the remarkable things about Sinn Féin and the IRA was how they managed to, as did Haganah in the old days in Israel. It's really hard as an underground operation to stop it. And even the IRA had the INLA and, and Haganah had Mr. Bacon and Mr. Shamir on the out, outriding assassins and so on. Very, very difficult. And in a, in a minor way, this is, this is what happened to this office. There's a huge amount of increase in violence, a lot of uh, damage, window breaking is well known. Uh, there was rather more than window breaking. Asquith went on a trip to Dublin, then part of the United Kingdom, and they set fire to a theatre trying to burn him out. Uh, and and they, they certainly engaged in hostile acts. They threw acid on some hapless electoral uh, registrar. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty nasty. The Malicious Damages Act cases, there's a lot of them, uh, where they're trying to avoid conviction by saying the damage they did was under five pounds. It had to be over five pounds. And they were being convicted under this. And there are quite comic efforts to say the amount of glass broken was four pounds, uh, 10 shillings, and not five pounds. And they produced all these experts to say that, in fact, the glass was only five. And it was all nonsense. And there's lots of them. Uh, uh, and they're very amusing. Tucked away in those magnificent times law reports on which I'm sure many of you depend for contemporary reports, very full reports, much fuller often than the, as it were, in inverted commas, ordinary reports. The, the, uh, the authorities crack down. There's uh, uh, a reliance on that old standby conspiracy. Uh, a number of the leaders are apprehended after a police raid on their headquarters, uh, the current LSE. Uh, on the 5th of March, 1912, uh, Mrs. Pankhurst is arrested and the Patrick Lawrences are also arrested. Christabel runs off to France, she escapes. Uh, they're brought before Coleridge J and a jury and it's conspiracy, which is a pretty, pretty big one. And there's a jury and uh, they're unlawfully conspired together with Christabel Pankhurst to incite members of the WSPU to commit damage. And this is getting tough. Jury, judge, conspiracy, uh, heavy. The jury reminded me of a jury that I read about when I was doing the book with Keith, directly after the Easter Rising in 1916. You did not want to be an Irishman facing charges before an English jury. And you didn't want to be facing an English jury uh, all male at this point in time, and the jury were horrible. Uh, but one juryman said, I rather enjoyed, uh, I, in fact, I led a performance of The Wreckers, which was an opera composed by the very famous suffragette, Dr. Ethel Smith. So he was an eccentric suffragette. He was removed, of course. It may have been judged uh, it, it tactless of him to announce that he had led uh, a celebration uh, by the most celebrated suffragette uh, uh, composer of the day. So he was gone. Uh, Rufus Isaac, famous, of course, then Attorney General, turned up and declared that, uh, I love this quote, if the WSPU had been successful in its campaign, then this would have meant nothing less than anarchy. Nothing less than anarchy. Which is, you know, I mean, they were, they were tough. But, uh, I mean, they weren't that scary, you know, but nevertheless, there you are. There you are. There we are. That's what he said. Uh, the jury was... It's a bit sad. These extensive reports are from the Times. Uh, the judge questioned the relevance of a defense line. Some of the jurors intervened to say, here, here. <laughs> Not a promising start. <laughs> and, and poor Petrick Lawrence, I have a lot of time for that guy. Petrick Lawrence, who's representing himself, he suggested, uh, you can imagine the scene. He says, may I, may I provide this material to the jury, my lord? And the jury man, the forum, the foreman of the jury says, oh, we don't think that's necessary, <laughs> to general laughter. So you know, you know you're not in great shape in a case when that happens, don't you? And uh, the judge reminds the jury uh, that uh, they haven't denied what they are alleged to have said, and the motives may be political, but criminal law dealt not with motives, but with intentions. They were convicted. There's a little interesting postscript to it. Uh, the, 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 issue, the jury found them. Uh, uh, guilty, but they added a rider 
saying they had a unanimous desire, a unanimous desire that the judge exercise, quote, the utmost clemency in light of the defendant's undoubtedly pure motives. Good old jury, despite their, despite their kind of laughing at them, they said, right, they're definitely convicted. And somebody in the jury room would say, well, they're, they're, I mean, you know, they were doing their best or something. And, and Mr. Coleridge, it has to be said, Mr. Justice Coleridge did not take the hint. <laughs> did not take the hint. He, 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 wasn't, he didn't get where he is today by listening to juries. So he jailed them all for nine months. Uh, and, of course, the next thing was uh, what division. I, I alluded to this, what division. And they uh, were sent to the second division, so they had no special privileges and nothing like that. Now, I won't go into it. I'm conscious of the time, but there is a fascinating range of exchanges because the nature of their division has becomes a huge issue. Where should they be? Should they be first division? And it had arisen in the context of a South African who'd been jailed, and the, there was quite a lot of political pressure to acknowledge the political nature of their action, and it was changed. They were transferred to the First Division. This had happened before, and the transfer led to a lot of pressure on the then Home Secretary and uh, from quite a lot of people that this was a severe interference in the rule of law. And uh, it happened, just as it happened earlier when the judge intervened to force a change. Uh, the postscript, which makes me feel sorry for poor old Petrick Lawrence, he ends up, the home, the two of them, the, the woman and her husband, the Petrick Lawrences, the defendants in the case, uh, they had to sell their home to pay the legal bill. And you learn that the Attorney General's bill was £351, 16 shillings and 6 pence. How did I find that out? Oh, yes. Women, clubs and associations in Britain, published by Routledge. I also found out that Petrick Lawrence was made a bankrupt and expelled from the Reform Club. So, you know, it's, uh, that's pretty heavy. I know it sounds ridiculous, but it's pretty heavy. What happened after that can be glided over. It's an ultimate slide. Uh, the thing goes out of control, basically. The cat and mouse bill was this incredible measure, which let them out when they were nearly dead and then brought them back in, starved them again, forced, uh, and let them out. So they, they pulled back on the forcible feeding, but the cat and the mouse, so the, they were playing with the mouse, and they were letting them out, and there were all these endless stories in the, in the suffragette papers about how terrible this was, and, you know, I, 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 and it was, seemed endless, seemed endless, in and out, in and out, in and out. Uh, and then Lansbury and Riley is a famous binding over case where George Lansbury, uh, who was a very strong suffragette supporter, was bound over uh, to keep the peace despite the absence. I think that was the case that established uh, that there didn't need to be a prior criminal offence, but I can't remember for sure. We had the famous death of Emily Davison diving in front of the Queen's horse, or somebody's horse, in, in whatever it was, Ascot or something, in 4th of June 23. We had a lot of fire bombing. Houses were, were attacked with fire. You know, there was quite a heavy level of what would absolutely be called terrorism today. Uh, the Roxby Venus was defaced, and as late as the 11th of June 2014, there was a full debate in the House of Commons on this matter. And then, of course, war. So the story's over. As I read, I was, I'm sure you guys think it's all rubbish, but I love George Dangerfield, The Strange Death of Liberal England, which I read when I was a kid. And I remember, you know, he was building up this whole idea of a collapsing country that was sort of the war transformed everything. I think it's true here. This was building up to be quite a big crisis, and it dissipated. The, the, most of the suffragettes pushed behind the war. Uh, Sylvia Pankhurst didn't, and there were splits, divisions, and it becomes a live issue, which I have no view on, to be honest with you. I can't remember if I have a view in the paper. I don't have a view now as to whether the suffragettes helped or hindered the achievement of women's suffrage. Uh, I think I have a general view on terrorism, I'll come to the end, which is that the problem with political violence is it's deployed in order to capture attention and communicate a message. But the nature of the violence is such that nobody sees the message, they just see the violence. And I think it obviously applies 
to contemporary acts of violence, but I even applied there. In people see the smashed glass, they see the slashed uh, statue, they see the house of the minister in flames, and, and they're not that interested in, 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 in the communication. I think that's one of the real problems that politically violent people have. How do you, how do you keep, the, how do you keep the, the discipline to allow the communication to be <clears throat> succinct and received? And it's what the climate guys have today. It's a real problem. It's a real problem. Other lessons? I don't know. I mean, I'd be interested now. This is, in a way, coming to the end of 45 minutes. is over to you. Uh, the rule of law was under quite a lot of pressure. Judges buckled. They made things easy. And they dressed it up as judicial interventions. They got called, which I think it was, to write a letter uh, to say, I've reflected. And it should be Division 2 or whatever it was, Division 1. Uh, and so they went to quite a lot of trouble to disguise executive interest in the arena, but it became politically very difficult for them to keep them in non-political prisoner situations. Uh, uh, you know, the same with Mrs. Thatcher and the IRA, you know, same sort of thing. It was all about political status. Uh, you know, uh, I say, let's get a sense of proportion. You may all know, I argue, you wouldn't necessarily know, but I always say, look, things weren't golden. I've written articles and practically books on there's no golden age. Don't assume there was ever a time when it was all marvellous. It's all been pretty tough. There's been or, or groups that have been shafted. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's not as new as you think it is. And so Keith and I in our various books and this are building that record. Keith added to it with the book on the 50s. So we've covered between us the 21st century. Uh, the vulnerability process speaks for itself. Uh, and then the follow-on question, does the Human Rights Act, would it have made a difference? Fascinating. Uh, the Human Rights Act definitely has achieved some change. There has been a big case in Supreme Court, Lord Reid went on holiday and five of the others, well, enough of them to make a difference, said that if you can establish a reasonable excuse, you're allowed to engage in direct action. Uh, Lord Reid has come back from holiday and he has devoted a quite unnecessary uh, 10 pages in a later case uh, eccentrically having nothing to do with the topic and with none of the five judges in the other case being allowed to prepare, saying how what a bad idea this is. So we'll see. We'll see. But it was definitely a human rights fueled, serious uh, argument that was suddenly available to protesters. And to I'm not being very clear, if I throw myself in front of a lorry, uh, if I throw myself in front of a uh, some sort of corporate operation or try and disrupt as something, and I'm charged with any crime that carries with it the defense of reasonable excuse, I'm able to say free speech. And then it becomes proportionality. And then you look at the extent to which there might have been other ways in which they could have got the thing to the location. And you look at the uh, seriousness of the thing. And suddenly, you're in, you're, you, you could, all you have is to persuade a magistrate. So, that's, so that had a change. Laporte, another case. There have been changes. There have been changes. But the Human Rights Act has not, of course, uh, protected the anarchy of which uh, whoever it was, Rufus Isaac, the Marquis of Reading, as he became uh, warned. Uh, where should I put any of this? Maybe I should put it nowhere. Maybe I should write a book and take a lot longer over it. Uh, I tried to get in the Oxford Journal of Legal Studies. They loved it, but they said not for us. Uh, I sent it to people who have sent extensive replies. Uh, I can't work out whether it's history or if it's law. If it's history, I don't have enough original materials. I'm supposed to find letters or I'm supposed to find archives that nobody's found. Uh, I can't make that up. It's too much of an effort. So it, it doesn't get into the history papers. Does it get into your world? Not so sure. Uh, I, I wrote to Neil, I think, said, may I speak to you? May I speak to you? He was very polite. And, and so I, I, I wrote with that in mind, so if you have any thoughts either now or in the pub where you are, uh, where you're going to feed me and give me, apparently Rosalind said in a major concession, drinks I don't have to pay for, mm -hmm. I'd be very grateful. Thank you very much. That's it. Thank you so much, Professor Kiersey, for a fascinating presentation. I will now take some questions from those in person and online.
Yes. Shall I go ahead? Yes. Thanks, Connor. That was that was really fascinating. Uh, I've got a question about this notion of sort of terrorism or you know political violence. Uh, we know that a lot of the suffragettes, um, you know, they also endorse other views, you know, be it socialism, be it vegetarianism, you know, some of them are sort of quite ardent sort of anti-vivisectionists. Do you think this played any role, maybe sort of exacerbated the the challenges they faced, both in politics and in law? Can we sort of dissociate that from, you know, just a pure sort of political struggle for or legal struggle for or, you know, the right to vote, or did these things sort of intersect? Do you mean kind of are there lessons for the anti vivisectionists and the animal rights people in this, or do you mean something slightly different, Raphael? I'm, I'm reflecting here on the sort of the historical sort of, you know, fact that the, the challenges that yeah. they faced and the fact that they were perceived as, you know, sort of terrorist up on the letter, if you like. Yeah. What role did those intersecting beliefs play in those challenges that they faced? Yeah, not sure. I'm not sure about interconnectivity. I've made a BBC radio program about the animal rights people, which involved interviewing them. And it was, I think, you know, it is, I think the peak of animal rights violence has passed, but I'm looking at you. I don't think it's as severe. Uh, and they had exactly the same problems as I explaining the suffragettes have. And, you know, let's make it current the Palestinian movement has at the moment. How do you find space and communicate without alienating people. And uh, there is, I, I, wrote a, I wrote a whole chapter on this in one of the books on civil liberties, which I really thought hard about, uh, and I'm quite proud of it. There is a really deep antagonism on the part of elected political leaders to political activism outside the parliamentary process, whether it is of direct action or of, uh, of criminal activity. And the reason there is, and I must say, I, was, I used to be quite close to the Labour government way back when, is because they've worked damn hard, excuse the word, to get elected. They go to various houses. They knock on doors. They argue for a change in cabinet and they lose. And they go out and defend what they know in their hearts is indefensible. They play a game for outcomes that are tempered by the need for concessions and conciliation. And they really feel quite strongly that this sort of thing is queue jumping. And that this sort of thing I mean by that is, look at me. My thing is so incredibly important. I want everything to stop instantly in order to give me what I want. And so there is uniting all of these domestic, politically violent people is a sense on the part of the elected representative distaste. The one remarkable exception moving beyond your question, and I'm sorry, is John Hume, who, who was the leader of the Constitutional Nationalist Party in Northern Ireland, who, who was affronted by the violence of the IRA and the extent to which it jumped into the political process with no accountability. And yet he sacrificed his own party to educate them in democracy in the hope that they would come in. And his brilliant success was the obliteration of his party as a party of national government. So there are occasional political leaders who can step outside, but they're very cross about this kind of thing. And it applied as much to the animal rights guys. Thank you. Sure. We have a question from one of our members online. Ben, would you like to ask a question? I can read it out if you prefer. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, my question is, how far did these cases prompt the judiciary to reflect on the differences in the tactics? between the WSPU, the Women's Freedom League, the NUWSS. It's not simply that they were considering the violence of the WSPU out of any kind of wider context. There are different varieties of political protest and political violence being enacted simultaneously. Did the judges ever reflect on that explicitly? Uh, thank you, Ben. I should look at you on, on the camera. Uh, my experience of this is that Judicial self-reflection, self-awareness, judicial engagement with their role, a consciousness that went beyond the decision, was not enormously evident. And I did not come across, I have to say I didn't look for, but I didn't come across evidence. I went trying to find biographies and so on of the judges, or autobiographies, uh, and I, I didn't find, I didn't find anything. So, and certainly 
flashing forward through the first war, through the second war, into the 50s with the Red Scares and so on, into the IRA, I, I didn't find much self, self-awareness is unfair because it implies a lack of self-awareness. But say take, and you may not have thought about this, Ben, or intended me to mention it, but I will mention it because when I was here as a very young fellow in Emmanuel College, I was went with John Spencer, whom we all know and love, to visit Lord Lane, the then Lord Chief Justice. And he was talking about two people from Cambridge who he was relaxed with, about his big challenge was the Birmingham Six case. And the Birmingham Six judgment by him was a vindication of state power at a time when state power was under stress. I doubt that he had any concerns about his engagement. I doubt it. I don't know. But of course, it was uh, what persuaded many people, including myself, that they cannot have been guilty beyond reasonable doubt. So I haven't found that, but I'm not in the primary literature and I haven't looked hard for it. I was in, in the earlier part of your talk, you were referring to a desire on the part of the authorities to avoid jury trial. And then in the um, Pithic Lawrence case, the jury appears to be, at least in terms of the verdict, deeply hostile yeah. to the suffragettes. Um, do those two go together? Do, and what, and then does the earlier desire to avoid jury trial represent a <coughs> distrust of the jury? Or something to do with publicity? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I, I could speculate, but I won't because I don't know. I do know that they definitely didn't bring charges that they could plausibly have brought, which would have produced a jury at an earlier stage. And I then did not lampoon and did not caricature, but reported what the jury said in the case in Petit Lawrence. But they added the unanimous rider to treat them with compassion. So there might be some sense of prudence on the part of prosecuting authorities, particularly in the early stage, to avoid the possibility of embarrassment. I used to be involved, again, going back to my Cambridge days, in advising on the what was called Operation Snowball, people who cut the fences in military bases in, in East Anglia. And there, there was a determination on the part of authorities to bring these in under non-jury-based charges. Uh, and so definitely then, I remember, it was the CND high point, you know, and, and there were these bases uh, uh, where they could not implausibly argue that they honestly believed that there was going to be nuclear destruction because they'd be the first finished when whoever it then was pushed the button in Moscow. Uh, and they didn't let that get near a jury. So I think there is a, a sensible prudence on the part of the authorities. But, of course, the language of terrorism now gets results. And so the Stansted 15, who were charged with terrorism offences, were convicted by a jury, and, and the appeal vacated the result. But that would have been one you might have expected a little bit of jury sympathy. Uh, you may remember it was a fairly outlandish, if I may say so, argument that there was a terrorist element to the chaining of them to the aeroplane that was going to take out the various people whom they said should be allowed to apply for asylum within the jurisdiction. Uh, the argument was that by, by causing the police to pay attention to them, they had diverted the police from the terrorist incidents that did not happen, but might have happened. And that would mean that any of us, like Neil on his way on a holiday to the Costa del Sol, has a few drinks in Stansted Airport, and he, he behaves in a completely uncharacteristic way. And then the police are called and so on. He could be done for terrorism because there might have been a terrorist atrocity which they couldn't have handled because they were looking after him. Now that is, of course, an entirely implausible hypothetical, hypothetical scenario. So that's my honest answer. Um, yeah, um, I just wanted to ask one question. Uh, in your presentation, you separated the concept I mean, uh, the political engagements into one faith in law and the other faith in themselves, which, I, uh, which pertain to violence. Uh, my question is pertaining to the overlaps that these two categories might have had, uh, in the sense that I think you already made it clear at the very outset that the, uh, your distinction need not be that neat. Uh, but I'm wondering about the overlaps, because 
uh, I study um, civil liberties in colonial India, and, and in that context, there are a lot of these overlaps where yeah. people who engage in violence or people who defend people who engage in violence are also people who are otherwise sort of propagating uh, legal means of resistance, uh, of means which do not sort of uh, violate uh, no, under means that are understood to be sort of legal. Yeah, no, it's a really, it's a really interesting <coughs> point you make, and I'm going to answer it by thinking about techniques of writing. And we'll take your particular interest at uh, the Indian subcontinent. My book on uh, on homeland insecurity is a whole chapter called Imperium, which traces the emergence of the language of terrorism in the uh, in the in the British and other empires. And I say that there's a shift from the military to the legal. And I say that the move was away from martial law and was away from uh, emergency towards legalization of the response to political turmoil and violence. And I give the example, you will know, to the Rowlett Commission and the Anarchical Violence Act of 1919 and so on, with which you'll be familiar. But there were, of course, pieces of legislation, the Thuggy Act, various other criminal procedure acts in the 19th century. So it's, there's overlap, but there's also the need for explanation. So I, I kind of weave in that to show I know about it and I make a big claim. And the reason I make a big claim is I'm trying to get people to follow the, the argument. And I, I don't believe I'm risking inaccuracy. And so here, as I showed, as I began to talk about faith and politics, I began with discussion about cases. Well, that was a bit contradictory, but it's it's a mechanism of exposition. And be con you know, if you think about your own work, be confident in car in categories as long as you don't overclaim for them, because then people have a chance of remembering what you said, which is a bonus. <laughs> In that case, thank you again, thank you. Professor Gitti, and please join me in thanking thank Professor Gitti so once again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.